Hi, everybody. Um, great to be here. Um, I want to. Sorry, I'm just going to click this. Okay, start by thanking the organizers for putting this uh, together. Um, it's been really interesting. Um, okay, so um, so so we've heard uh, in this workshop about really fundamental concepts of reward prediction and learning. And uh, my message in this talk that I'd like to convey is that attention is another one of these uh, big cognitive constructs uh, that's um, with a longstanding history where I think a lot of this comes together and that integrates um, reward prediction and learning with um, action. So a fundamental, um, so dimensionality reduction, how do I have that first? Uh, it might not be on. Okay. Hmm. Glitch. Let's try this. There, it works now. It works now. Okay. Okay, so a fundamental problem that every biological organism has to solve is to reduce the dimensionality of the information it receives. Information in the external world is practically infinite, and we have to find that subset of very small subset of information that is useful um, for guiding behavior. And how this happens is a long standing question um, that garners more and more uh, interest because it's becoming somewhat tractable, as you'll see. So this is one example from a recent study from the from John O'Doherty's lab, in which um, they used deep learning. So they trained a deep, deep network on a set of standard um, video games. And, and then they compared the internal representations that developed in these networks with fMRI recordings uh, from the human brain in the same kind of games. They had a lot of finding, but the one that I want to highlight here um, is this one, um, where you can see that, um, so they, um, they, they extracted a measure that they called nuisance invariance, and, and that is the extent to which an internal representation is invariant um, to irrelevant stuff, to, to visual stimuli that are not relevant to the immediate goals. So the degree of nuisance invariance in the internal uh, layers of the network predicted activity in mid-level visual areas here in green, superior parietal, uh, lobule, and other mid-level visual areas, particularly along the dorsal stream. So again, you can see that that's different from primary visual areas, V1, V2, V3, um, that seem to, to give a more complete representation of what's out there. So uh, this is a key, uh, this is the key operation, right? Throwing away stuff that is irrelevant. And uh, this is a cool finding, but it is uh, not new. So, okay. So um, a very long time ago, when I was a postdoc um, in the last century, literally, um, we found that uh, <laughs> um, we did experiments in the dorsal, um, uh, in the frontoparietal network, which some of you may know controls uh, visual attention and eye movements. And we found that so neurons in a, this is a, a behaviorally relevant by the experimenter or are made salient. And this is what we call a priority map. So for example, here we might have eight things on the screen, but the neurons encode one or a handful of those. Um, so we have individual neurons that somehow have managed, managed to focus on relevant information. We have known for a very long time that this happens. Uh, we still don't know exactly how it happens. Uh, why do we not know how it happens? Um, well, so what the problem is, we want to understand how the brain gives rise to a sparse visual representation that changes rapidly to serve the immediate behavioral goal. And these things, these concepts here have, are 
um, studied in siloed fashion in our field, um, especially among empiricists, we are guilty of this. So a lot of labs study vision uh, and visual representation with no reference to behavioral goals. Uh, the other half of our field studies decision-making uh, and it's all about reward and, and costs, uh, but it has no reference to information. It's contentless, co contentless. And so the things that we've been thinking about um, in our lab for, lo for the longest time is how are these two uh, connected? Because this is really what attention is all about, uh, connect content with goals. And so how does this uh, representation uh, come to be? Okay, so uh, to answer this, let's just take a, a step back. So, so let's just think about attention. And for our purposes, we just uh, we can think of an eye movement. That's a good enough uh, proxy of attention. Um, it's good that um, this is sort of a godsend that in monkeys and humans we have a foveated visual system. Uh, and so, by tracking eye movement, it's it's a pretty good indication of what somebody what information one wants to extract from the world. Um, okay, so information in a technic technical sense, which you all know, it's a reduction of uncertainty. Um, and so we can think about, we think about eye movements as a sort of interrogation strategy. So an eye movement is a question you pose to the world and also an attempt to answer that question with a specific answer. Okay, so there is, um, you know, that we know something about how this should be um, done. How do we attempt, how do we reduce uncertainty? We have the Bayesian framework. This um, standard uh, form of the Bayesian formula that's used and tested in many experiments assumes that the datum that one makes inferences on is given to you. So, so for example, so here the log, the, the D, D is known, right? What is the probability of one hypothesis over another, given that you've seen the information? But in order to explain attention, we have to uh, rearrange this equation because we have to consider uh, a proactive demand for information, right? So when you're looking at a particular spot, what you see in your periphery is a blur. Um, you don't know what the datum is you just know something higher order about the source of information. So for example, you might see a, 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 a traffic light that's in your visual periphery, or you might know that the traffic light is at a particular location. You know something about the source of the traffic light, but you don't know if it is red or green. And so your eye movement has to be based on something that you know about the traffic light as a source before you know whether it is red or green. And so you can formalize it with this measure of expected inf information gain, which if you work through it, is also a function of the prior uncertainty. So if you, if you have uncertainty about whether you should stop or proceed at an intersection, you, want, you need the traffic light. But if you don't have uncertainty, if you know that you should stop or proceed, you don't even need to look at the traffic light, right? There's no expected information gain. And also the second term that's important here is the diagnosticity of the traffic light, which is related to the likelihood, but it's, it's um, more as the, the certainty of the likelihood. So you, you must know that the traffic light will make a valid prediction, will reduce your uncertainty, regardless of whether it shows red or green, right? So, um, okay. So, so this is uh, what motivates the title of my talk, because in our field, it, empirically, we study um, uncertainty is studied in um, experiments on exploration, exploitation, exploration, trade-offs. Uh, diagnosticity isn't really studied there. Diagnosticity presupposes a knowledge about your sources of information. And that's, uh, in a sense, a more difficult question. So that's related to relevance. Uh, but they two, both must combine in order to guide your attention. Okay, so, so given this theoretical framework, we uh, conducted a number of experiments to see whether that priority map that I've shown you in the parietal cortex may actually be a sort of map of expected information gains. And we looked at um, uncertainty and diagnosticity in two separate experiments. Um, so what we did here, this, this is a task that was performed by monkeys. So the monkeys would start uh, a trial by looking at that yellow dot, and they saw three stimuli on the screen. The white, uh, the white dots here, up and down, 
uh, represent his final decision alternative. So at the end of each trial, the monkey has to look up or look down to receive a reward if he does it correctly. But before looking at, before giving his final answer, the monkey has to look at this cloud of dots. And that is his source of information. When the monkey makes, after he makes a saccade to the cloud, the, the, the dots begin to move and they can move up or down. And that tells the monkey how, uh, gives them information about which target is correct. So our interest was um, we put, we arrange the test so that the dots were in the receptive field of a, a parietal neuron cell. And we were interested in what happens during that decision period while the monkey sits in the center and plans to make the eye movement to the dots. And uh, okay, and the first question is, does that planning uh, response, does that get modulated by, um, by decision uncertainty? So we manipulated uncertainty in different blocks of trial. So uh, in some blocks, when the monkey fixated, there was a 50-50 probability that the upper dot or the lower dot was correct. So the monkey couldn't know in advance which one was correct, but he knew by virtue of training that looking at the dots will resolve that uncertainty. So here he expected to gain information from his eye movement. In other block of trials, we simply kept the target fixed. So for example, um, the monkey might, um, might know that for the next 50 trials, it's always the upper target. He also had, we, we, we made the monkey, he had to look at the dots, um, but he only received redundant information. So the dots were relevant for his reward. They had reward value, but they had no information gain, okay? So um, the, Be the Bayesian prediction would be that uh, the priority of those, the responses to those, the cloud of dot would be higher in high uncertainty relative to low uncertainty uh, blocks. And this is indeed what we found. And I'm gonna go through this quickly. So a lot of the neurons that we saw, more than around 50% of the neurons uh, responded more. So they, they do prioritize the dots more if there is high information, if they expect the information is expected to be gained. And again, remember that this is all proactive because the information only is delivered after the saccade, right? Um, Okay, in a second uh, study, we, we used the same design, but now we looked at diagnosticity or predictive validity. And the way we did this is we put, um, we put a, a colored uh, border around uh, patches of dots. So in this case, we, allowed, we gave, allowed monkeys to choose between two alternative patches of dots and tell us which one they want to look at. And uh, the different colors indicated different predictive validity or diagnosticity. And this was merely by statistic, the stimulus strength was always strong. Uh, but what we manipulated is the probability that the motion will correctly indicate the final target. So for example, in this black, uh, the, the black ring told the monkey that this is a perfectly valid, uh, whenever, whenever this, uh, cloud of dots says up, the reward will be up. Whenever it says down, the reward will be down. But the green cloud uh, has a 20% chance of just uh, being wrong, right? So from 20% uh, of the trials, the motion would be down, but truly the reward would be up. Um, these were highly trained stimuli. We had three uh, different levels of predictive validity, and we gave them to the monkeys in different pairs. The monkeys usually chose the correct validity. It was interesting, though, that they weren't perfect despite massive, massive overtraining, and they tended to match. So they distribute their attention in proportion to relative uh, validity, which is rather than maximizing, they tended to, to match. Um, and, um, and we also found, okay, so the neurons encode that sort of match uh, function. Uh, this slide is a bit uh, complicated, but basically what I'm showing here is the different pairs of validity. So here on the left is uh, 50 versus 100%. So maximum predictive versus non-predictive stimulus, easy discrimination. On the right is the most difficult discrimination that we had, 100% versus 80%. In every condition, the, the, uh, the, the neurons told us which way the eye movement will go. But more interestingly, the strength of that signal depended on the relative validity of the stimuli. Um, so you can extract the signal here in, um, in red. The relative validity was encoded way before the neurons told you exactly where the eye was going to go. 
Um, so we think that the matching operation is results directly from uh, competitive, uh, from, from connected networks that do competitive normalization. Um, and they never fully filter out even the, uh, the, the worst uh, stimulus. Okay, so, so we have some uh, proof of principle that these priority maps that have been a mystery encode something like uh, expected information gain. And that gives us the real leverage because we know a lot of the neural substrates um, relate, that, that generate eye movements and control eye movements. So that gives us a real leverage to understand how these, um, uh, how these, substrate, how these circuits are engaged in order to reduce uncertainty and make predictions and learn. Um, so one question uh, that we've asked is, okay, so we have an effect of uncertainty, where does that come from? Um, and um, and, and um, the, um, the first hypothesis that suggests itself from our field is that it has to do with executive control. So we think that the priority maps uh, that, that uh, guide the eye movements uh, are controlled by this network of um, executive function. Okay, so, um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about um, executive function. So the executive circuit um, is thought to be centered on this part of the brain um, that's called the anterior cingulate cortex and the medial part of the brain. And, um, and, and here, I'm, uh, this is a computational model that summarizes you know, a, a ton of, um, of research uh, from Massimo Silvetti, who's, uh, who we are uh, collaborating with. Um, and basically the idea is that the ACC receives information from reward structures, so in a sense from the um, dopamine neurons, membrane dopamine, and those convey the utility of a task. Um, and it detects task jun junctures in which there is a need for control. In other words, you might need to do a little better in order to get the rewards that you want in the task. When the ACC detects a need for, for control, it sends descending projections to this nucleus called the locus ceruleus that releases norepinephrine and broadcasts this broadly throughout the brain. And what norepinephrine does is optimizes processing of whatever computation uh, you need to be optimized in order to maximize reward rates. Um, so, so this is a reinforcement meta-learning, right? So we have an evaluation of the cost and benefits. And by the way, the the, the rewards of the task are conveyed by dopamine. The call for a boost of norepinephrine is a cost. Okay, so, so the goal of the system is to maximize reward while minimizing the need for norepinephrine. Um, so this model has been applied to um, various, um, to various um, findings on that you can get uncertainty dependent modulations of learning rate, uh, memory, physical effort. Um, and we found in collaboration with Massimo that um, this can be naturally, without any parameter tuning, can naturally explain our um, uncertainty modulation in, in the parietal cortex, simply by assuming that if you have, you have norepinephrine that affects a visual map, and it enhances the responses in the visual map in situations that have high uncertainty. Right? So all we need is that the ACC would detect, now you have uncertainty, uh, and it would call for a release of norepinephrine, which then enhances the gain of sensory information that reduces the uncertainty. And this uh, falls out without a representation of uncertainty, simply as um, a function, as, a, as an internal cognitive state that leads to reward maximization. Okay. So um, this is the hypothesis that we have um, so far is that, um, so, 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 so the way this uh, dorsal system works is that when you have a task or behavioral goals, you might load uh, perhaps in your memory, a map of the predictors that are relevant to the task. And that map is, um, uh, the, the, the map uh, implements um, competitive interactions among the, the candidate visual stimuli, so you only attend or look to one at a time. Um, and the presence of uncertainty biases the competition in favor of the most reliable predictors. So, for example, if you have, if you're in a state of low uncertainty, um, for example, let's say you can predict exactly what I'm going to say now, your priority maps might be relaxed and your attention will start to wander. 
But if you're in a state of higher uncertainty, um, that would be basically a signal just attend right here. This is the best predictor. Um, and that's um, and that's how this works. So this is our hypo hypothesis. You notice that I'm not explaining here exactly how this map of diagnosticity arises. Uh, that is a very uh, important question that we're working on, probably involves uh, very long-term learning. In humans, it also arises by instruction. And I think that there are many, um, it's a concept-based process. In any case, it's some sort of model or memory-based process. Um, Okay, so uh, one thing I'll just end by, by highlighting, uh, so there are a, a, a lot of questions to be answered in this framework, but one thing that we, uh, that this help us understand is the meaning of those rewards. So, so physiologists are finding that rewards uh, shape activity in visual areas, um, including the parietal cortex and also even earlier visual areas. And that's always been puzzled, uh, a puzzling source uh, it, it, the, the, the effects are not well explained, and sometimes the effects are counterintuitive and don't seem to make any sense. And um, such a, we, we found such an effect even in our task, in the task with the uncertain, where we manipulated uncertainty, as I showed you before. If you look here in the, in the bottom, so you see the two um, here on the right, there the firing rates that we find in the parietal cortex. So you see that high uncertainty was above low uncertainty, as I've shown you. But we also manipulated rewards, and we found that paradoxically, the neurons respond more for smaller reward sizes, uh, which is entirely incompatible with any sort of economic value. Uh, people thought that the reward modulations here encode economic value, but in our hands, they were just opposite. And moreover, when we switched to a different task, the sign of this reward modulation switched also. So it's definitely not a consistent representation of value. Um, in the context of the reinforcement meta learning, this can be explained, and you can see that the model reproduces this paradoxical effect. And it turns out to be something that happens in a particular regime if the task is a particular level of difficulty, a particular level of total rewards. I don't have time to go into the, into the details, but basically it comes out of the fact that this is not a representation of value. It tells you how you have to optimize your cognitive state to maximize value. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole different thing. Um, okay, in the same framework, uh, we, can, uh, we could explain intrinsically motivated uh, information demand. So, um, so in, in what I've shown you so far, as I've told you, there's information demand that's totally a result of reward optimization. So it's driven by an external reward. Uh, but we also have experiments in which animals can, are looking and getting information just as a good of in itself, and it doesn't help them increase the external rewards. And the way that we uh, that Massimo mo modeled this in in this particular model is by simply um, by adding. So this is the traditional dopamine uh, utility function. Um, if you simply add a term related to volatility and you try to minimize volatility, um, you can again. Uh, reproduce, um, you, you, we can also reproduce findings from um, internal uh, intrinsic rewards. And we're now working on applying this to uh, neural uh, results, which again, are not immediately intuitive. Um, okay. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. And, um, and uh, what did we learn? Um, so we, I think we should think about this system of eye movements and attention as a really useful model system for understanding dimensionality reductions, uh, adaptive dimensionality reduction. Um, we have some evidence, we have evidence that the frontal parietal network encodes a sort of Bayesian process that's at least um, uh, sensitive to the relevant va variables of uncertainty and diagnosticity. Uh, the computations are, we already see they're not perfectly Bayesian and that actually aligns to behavior, which is, um, um, an interesting uh, line of research. Um, this, uh, so th this, pro this prioritization is regulated by executive network that do cost benefit trade-offs. Uh, it's also interesting, and I didn't have time to talk about this, is that the reward rewards are absolutely necessary in order to guide uncertainty reduction to the appropriate places, but rewards can also have all kinds of counterintuitive and not optimal effects and can direct 
uh, search to take to sources of information that are actually less informative, they redu are redundant, they reduce less uncertainty. And that's obviously, uh, I think Talia Sharad will speak more about this, but that seems to be 